Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to have you join us for today's webinar. I'm Donna Brayton, and today we are going to be talking about applying the 15 key culture actions for change management success. So I would guess you're probably a little curious. That's great. Last time we got together, we talked about the 15 key culture actions and you're wondering maybe how do they really relate to a real life change project? That's exactly what we're going to talk about today. So I want to make sure that you understand we're not going to cover every single action in depth. Um, we are going to focus on four specific things and those are um, these four insights to move you into action. So we're going to do a little bit of an overview for those of you who could not join us in our last webinar and just make sure that you're grounded in the concepts that helped us create those 15 key culture actions. Then we're going to share with you some insights around messaging in culture change, the from to framework, which is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, we're going to share the number one factor in culture change success, which is shared learning and mutual understanding. We're going to explore what that is and how to create it and even share a little story with you about what not to do. And then finally, we're going to talk about resistance and a real life case of a situation of mistaken identity around resistance. There was a project team we worked with that didn't understand there was actually a deep seated cultural belief that needed reframed. And so um, just a caution, sometimes when we see resistance, it's not what we think. And we're going to tell you more about that. All right. So moving right along, I'm Donna Brayton. And um, the conversation on applying the 15 key culture actions will be facilitated by me and Scott Belke. I'm happy to be here and look forward to contributing to the conversation. Fabulous. Thanks, Scott. So Scott and I work together. Um, we've done a ton of culture and change projects together. And so we're going to draw on our wisdom, our experience, and um, the lessons that we've learned along the way as we've applied culturally intelligent change. Um, before we talk about how the 15 key culture actions came to be, um, I wanted to share something interesting with you. So when we were preparing for our last webinar, one of our team members asked, why in the world are you doing this? So we thought, hey, we should share with you our why, that we have a deep conviction about the value and potential of every human being, and we are doing whatever we can, whether it's through our Tuesday's Tremendous Tips or these webinars or many of the other things that we do to help unlock that potential because we want you to be at your best. So our hope in this time today is that you, you learn something that helps you be that much more successful in your work and in your life. So quick review, before we get into the application and story sharing as part of our webinar, we wanted to make sure that you were familiar with the concept of culturally intelligent change and how we started pulling the 15 key culture actions together. So let's start off with the definition. Now here's something interesting. Just like we say change leadership, and we all know that change is a fundamental part of leadership, when we say culturally intelligent change, we acknowledge that culture is a fundamental part of change. However, it's critical enough that we felt it was important to pull it out and really emphasize it. We've worked with organizations large and small. Very few do full change management, and I'm talking all the way from doing org readiness, all the way through sustaining the change so that it's fully realized. And for those of you on the phone, I'd love to hear from you in the chat. What's your experience been? So do you generally, when you work on a project, do you get to do full change management all the way from beginning to end? or are they in fact cutting back on the budget and reducing it back to just communication and training, which is great, but in reality, it's not change management. So our observation is that for many of the projects that are doing change management, very few, and we see about less than 1% are actually using culture as the guide to create their change plans. So hence, 
that's why we said there's real importance here around doing culturally intelligent change. And Steve, I see you're saying, yep, similar to what our observation is, communication and training is, is what a lot of companies think that change management is. Now, Patty said for transformation changes, she gets to do all of the change management, um, but other projects are more just the training and communications. So yeah, unfortunately, we really don't get to do full change management all the time. So the objectives, whenever we're working on culturally intelligent change are twofold. Managing, minimizing, or avoiding the culture flashpoints, so those things that are creating resistance in our change projects, and then maximizing the outcome, the results. So later in this webinar, as I shared earlier, we're going to actually talk about the story of a change project where culture created resistance. So an example here of a culture flashpoint, it got mislabeled by the project team. And as we said, it was a case of mistaken identity. So by being more culturally intelligent in your change, it will help you be more successful. Um, yeah, we heard from Graham. He said there's a lot of upfront excitement around change management, and then it just, the energy tails off. And Jody said there's very little appreciation for strategic culture change. Um, Connie said that's a good point. It depends on when we get brought in on projects. Sometimes we do all of it, and sometimes just the communications, planning, and training. So the 15 culture actions are here. Um, but I'd like to walk you through kind of how they got created. Because as we said, these key culture actions are created specifically so that you do culturally intelligent change. And so in order to do that, we said, we need to make sure we have a common definition of change management to build on. So we pulled this from the standard for change management. And you can see here that it's applying a structured approach rather than trying to decide which structured approach we would connect culture with, we saw tons of fantastic, wonderfully um, helpful change management approaches. There's lots of them. So we decided that we really needed to get at a deeper level at the foundational elements that all these great methodologies have in common. And for that, we turned to the process groups captured in ACMP's standard for change management. So this way, whatever approach you use, which kind of connects on top of those process groups, can get mapped to these 15 key culture actions. So that's how we structured and um, addressed those 15 key culture actions. And as you can see here, um, the key to culture change really falls in this part in the develop and execute where there's shared learning and results. And that's one of the actions we're going to get into today. So that's just a little of the um, kind of formation and history and how we came about developing them and how they're connected um, between culture and change. And one last definition, just to make sure that we're all aligned, what is culture? So it's this, um, this is the more technical definition, those shared values and beliefs that can lead to behavioral norms. Or the other way to look at it is just, what is it that you're expected to do? How, um, how are you expected to behave around here? So that's culture. Now for the um, meat of what we're talking about today. Our focus, again, is looking at four specific insights in these 15 key culture actions. And we're going to get into them in a little bit more depth and hopefully give you some things you can walk away with and apply today. So starting off, we're going to talk about messages that matter. And this is important because there's some things that you should say and some things you should not say. And we're going to start off with some cautions and watch outs as you're explaining culture change. So um, Scott, I'm going to ask about your experience here, but I find a lot of times when we're working with leadership teams, they get really excited about what they're learning, both the good and the bad. And they think like, wow, this is really exciting. And they start thinking about the ideal culture they can create and start communicating it to employees and their teams. And then what happens? And then their teams get confused. Exactly. Because they start thinking, wow, like, do we really have a bad culture? Like, what's wrong with us? Mm -hmm. And so instead of feeling excited and positive about the culture change. They start feeling, they start having negative impressions of it. Exactly. In some cases, they already knew they had a negative culture and they don't have that bad response, but 
a lot of times there are things in the culture that are good that you don't want to attack or make people feel bad about. Precisely. So here's a couple of things to think about. Rather than characterizing culture as good or bad, is the idea is that it's either helping to support your change or it's preventing, inhibiting, or working against your change. So rather than you know, kind of putting this characterization around it that it's good or bad, mm -hmm. it's is the culture really working for you? Exactly. And then the other thing that's really important is and it's kind of funny, right? Because throughout the whole presentation, we're talking about doing culture change, but does culture really change? No. <laughs> Why not? Well, it's, it transforms. It moves from uh, where it is now to a different place, uh, but there's always some aspect. It's really grounded deep in the organization, and so it's more of a transformation than a change. I guess technically it does change, but it's more of a transformation than mm -hmm. out with the old and in with the new. Correct. So it's kind of, that's why we're saying here, it's like a bit of a shift. Correct. And it happens over time, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of times leaders say they wish that there was some magic pill you could give people that makes it all different, but that's unfortunately not the case. No, it's through the shared learning and mutual understanding. Exactly. That we're going to talk about later. That's right. So again, some cautions and watch outs is that the words that leaders use do have power, which means if a leader starts talking about we're going to transform culture, or we're going to make some changes here, it can leave the impression with the employees that whatever exists is bad and that immediately can cause resistance. So again, be really careful about the words that you use. Um, just this past week, I was debriefing a culture assessment with a leadership team. And at the end, one of the things that we concluded was, what are the messages that you're going to share with the rest of the organization? And this was a really powerful insight for them that they needed to say, hey, there's a lot of good in this organization. So that gets to point number three here, where we do have strength. There's a lot of positive good stuff. And rather than just say, oh, we need to change. Let's build on that and let's connect back to that because people feel a lot more confident moving forward in change when it's connected to the strength of the history and the positive things that exist in the organization. So you can see here, it's also um, referred to as bright spots. For those of you who are familiar with Dan and Chip Heath's book, Switch, which is a fabulous read on change, they talk about this, that part of the way you can create positive change is by finding those bright spots, finding where it works in the organization and building on them. So we're just calling that out here in the context of culture change, find the strengths and build on them rather than try to invent and do something brand new. All right, the next uh, key watch out in terms of uh, messages that matter when you're communicating about culture change is um, the idea of managing uh, communication centrally. So culture change should always, always, always be done in connection with a business priority. Uh, whatever, uh, whether it's a new strategy implementation, as was the case with the leadership team I was working with this past week, um, they were implementing a new strategy and they were saying, hey, we want to know how our culture is going to reinforce or be resistant to the strategy that we have in place. But change, culture change on its own is something that should never um, be done. It's generally not, it's never going to be as successful as when it's connected to a business priority. So messaging consequently needs to be integrated and I'm sure you can all relate to situations where messaging is done separately, you know, maybe the communications um, is coming out from the change team. Oh, and then by the way, there's another message over here and um, I call that death by a thousand messages and they get really confusing for the people receiving them. So wherever possible, make sure that they're integrated and um, understandable by the organization because that helps reinforce and help people understand how it aligns with everything going on in the organization. All right, the next kind of point here as we talk about creating messages that matter, um, I want to acknowledge again for all of the brilliant change practitioners on the phone, this is not a new concept. <laughs> 
but it's important enough to remember and reinforce that when it comes to culture change, we want to make sure that we do create a ch culture change master story. And the reason for that, just like we talked about wanting to have kind of an integrated approach to doing communication about the culture change, uh, it's really important that there's a consistent way that you talk about the changes that are happening. And how you can do that is set up something um, in this culture change master story template that in a single page captures all the key and core elements about that change that's, that's occurring so that any leader that's talking about it says the same things. Um, and again, we all know and can point to probably many experiences in our change careers where you've got leaders who've gone rogue and are sharing different things and create tremendous confusion in an organization. So when it comes to culture change or any change, it's essential to remain consistent. And by creating that change master story, uh, it enables that to, to happen. Now we're moving on to probably one of my favorite tools in all of the ones that we use as we're um, working with organizations and uh, debriefing them and sharing with them about their culture and how to make changes. And the reason is it's incredibly simple and super powerful. Um, so before we show you that from two framework, just wanted to share with you a couple cha culture change principles. The first one is that people interpret values from their own perspective, how they see things. And so rather than just allow people to come up with their own definitions, it's really important that you take those values and translate those into behaviors. So Scott, we had a really interesting situation around um, values in an organization where people were in fact interpreting them their own way. Remind me which one you're talking about. I've seen this several times. So um, this is where people, the values were really well understood in the organization. Mm -hmm. So well understood, in fact, that um, they stopped being defined by how the company was defining them and started being defined by how the people and individuals were defining them, such as we do the right thing. Uh, yes, we do the right thing. I love that one in particular. Um, so the organization started having people do things that were actually against the rules of the industry that they were in, making them out of compliance, but they were doing the right thing for the customer. But nobody defined what the right thing was and what that looked like in reality with actual examples and clear language so that when people were doing the right thing for the customer, they weren't doing the right thing for the custom for the organization. Exactly. So that's a beautiful example of how people can sometimes interpret values from their own point of view. It's what meant what it meant to them versus the like Scott said, those very specific behaviors. Another one that was really interesting, and I can't remember if it was connected to that value or a different one, where um people felt like if it was we do the right thing or we care it was something like well that means that you'll never fire me do you remember that one i do <laughs> so it, it, yeah that was the, people people matter is what that one was all that's about. right so it's like so if people matter how can you fire us exactly so it was really interesting, again, how people can interpret values from their own point of view, because I can see, you know, if people matter, then you're never going to let me go because I matter. Um, so the point here is that whenever you are creating change, just defining values is insufficient. It has to be focused on behaviors, very, very specific behaviors. So that leads into point number two in these culture change principles, and that is need to focus on shifting just a few values or behaviors. And that's where this framework of the from to comes into place because it enables very clearly for anybody to understand what you're moving from, what you're going to stop doing, what you're going to start doing for those of you who have used that framework. Um, and then the last culture change principle, as Scott said, we're going to address this in an upcoming section. We're going to talk about shared learning and mutual experience. So from two, here's what it looks like. Extremely simple. And it's unbelievably powerful because I'm going to share with you kind of the story of, of, of how we work through this. 
Um, so the first thing you have to do is think about in the context of what. Um, so like I was mentioning the leadership team I was working with, they're implementing a brand new strategy. So rather than just doing a from to, we talked about what does success look like as that strategy gets implemented. And then this is where doing the qualitative culture assessment comes in because we were able to pull specific data elements from that qualitative uh, assessment into the behaviors that everybody saw were the biggest gaps. And so they could map those behaviors and start kind of having clues about where to look, what was holding them back, where those culture flashpoints were. And, um, and then that enabled them to look on the flip side of what they needed to move to. So again, you need to say in the from to framework, what is it that we're focused on? Is it strategy? Is it um, you know, your, your big um, a change project? Maybe you're doing a transformational change project. Or maybe it's something um, more, I call it simple, but a uh, technology change project. And you have to say, in order for this to be successful, whatever that change is that you're responsible, what are some of the things holding us back? And what are the, some of the behaviors, the things we need to start doing? All right, so this all sounds fabulous from a theoretical perspective. Um, let's take a quick look at how culture data can help inform this framework. So here's an example of some specific culture behaviors that um, come from the Human Synergistics uh, OCI, or Organizational Culture Inventory. So it's an example of how current culture behaviors are defined on the left and ideal culture as defined by leaders is on the right. So these are just examples of how um, somebody might be processing the data, might take a look and say, oh, I can see if these things are going on in the current culture, I'm not gonna take a lot of chances, I'm gonna wait to make decisions and, and ask my boss instead of doing it myself. Um, we've got some passive aggressive here in terms of opposing things indirectly. I'm just gonna follow orders, even when they're wrong, I'm not gonna challenge authority because I don't wanna you know, get in trouble. So if that's the current behavior behavior, then what is, is a project really going to be successful? If you're trying to make change, what might be some things that could hold you back? So that's where these behavior norms are incredibly helpful in the qualitative data. And then we can look at, oh, here's some ways we need to start behaving. Now, I've seen it work a variety of different ways. Um, sometimes as we're working with the leadership team, they actually pull these behavioral elements directly um, from the qualitative data. Others um, use it as a guide and kind of direct their conversation to other elements that are important to them. So let me give you some actual examples of what a from to framework might look like. So here's the first one that I'll share with you. Now, this comes from an organization that was going through significant change. In fact, it was two companies that were in the process of integrating. So you had the um, target, target and the acquiring company. And what they were recognizing that if they were going to be successful into the future, they had to stop us versus them. So it's no longer, you know, the names of the companies as they used to be, but this is the overall, they needed to become one team with one plan and recognize kind of like together is better than, um, than, than apart. So in order for that to happen, and that all sounds great, it's almost like one of those wonderful t-shirt uh, slogans, right, that we can print up and be like, yay, we're going to have one team, one plan, this is awesome. Um, but that's insufficient. Because if you remember back to those um, culture change principles we talked about, a key thing is defining that from behavioral terms. What does it mean when we're going to stop with the us versus them and we're going to start behaving as one team with one plan? So that's where you can see below that some very specific behaviors. Um, as I mentioned, um, in this particular case, they did use the qualitative culture data and they pulled some of the language from it, but then they also used some of their own language. So you can see here in us versus them, these were the behaviors in their environment that were most um, impactful and would prevent them 
from accomplishing their ultimate integration goals. So everything from blaming others and pointing out flaws to questioning decisions and challenging others, those are the specific behaviors. And can you see how easy it is to quickly identify if some of those behaviors are taking place? It's a lot easier than just like, oh, you're still behaving like us versus them. You know, what does that mean? Then, so that's what you're stopping, but what you're starting, that behaviors you're focused on, um, you can see on the right side. Healthy, candid debate and rallying around decisions. Again, this is something you can all probably identify with, where um, in this situation, they were really challenged because they would sit in a meeting, um, there would be some conversation, and then there would be the meeting after the meeting right? We're all familiar with that. And people would re-decide, re-debate, re-discuss. And then, well, maybe they didn't really agree with the decision, so they underhandedly kind of made that clear. And that, unfortunately, created a ripple effect in the organization. So that's the, um, in the from, we're going to stop playing politics and stop avoiding confrontation and instead when we're sitting down having that conversation we're going to have um, healthy and open debate but then once a decision was made we're going to stick with it so that's just an example um, again of behavior what i really like about this tool is the aha moment that it creates at the executive team level because a lot of times we've experienced executives that are really good at setting the big us versus them and moving it over to one team plan, no big deal. But when they get down to the specific behaviors that they need to implement, you see an aha moment happen in the room. And because there's only three on here, um, it makes it easy for them to remember. Exactly. That focusing element is super important. So I wanted to share one other example. I think you guys are getting, getting the point. But um, here again, you have kind of the overarching description of what you're moving from, what you're moving to, and then those very specific behaviors. Um, so you can see here that um, uh, many people might experience this, right? I'm sure you can probably all identify like, yes, if only we could follow, you know, proactively share ideas and not just share them, but act on them so that we actually make improvements together as a team. And then some of the specific actions, um, instead of not capturing the action items, we're going to stop doing that. We're going to start as a team documenting and committing to action items. And then in that situation, Scott, we probably would, um, you know, make sure everybody had an agreed upon protocol that they were following so that there was consistency in that behavior. One other comment about this. Um, this was a large organization and this was the, it's not like they had 20 templates like this. This was the one template that the executive team agreed on that they were going to spread across the entire organization. So it was simple, it was straightforward, and it had laser focus. And the impact was fantastic. So that's a great point when you talk about the laser focus. It's really easy. I remember one leadership team, they like created a list and then they created another list and then they amended that list. And it was so confusing because every time they got together, they were making more and more behaviors they thought everybody should do, which is kind of like whenever we set New Year's resolutions, right? Where, well, I want to lose weight and I'm going to start exercising and you make all these like hopeful behavior changes that are going to take place. And generally, people don't follow through on them. So the yeah. idea is that you pick a key couple behaviors and then those begin the ripple effect where other things can start changing. Well said. So that's the from two. All right, so let's move on to shared learning and mutual understanding. And it was funny, Scott, we were having a conversation about this, right? Because we hear this over and over and over. This is like Edgar Schein's rallying cry. <laughs> uh, Tim Coupler says this all the time as well. And it's a great phrase, but we we're like, well, let's break it down. What does that really mean? That was a nice shout out for Tim Coupler. It was. So here's the story. Imagine you are sitting in a meeting, and again, this is a caricature of a meeting that probably many of us have been part of at one point or another in our careers. Now, if you're like me, and you've been in this meeting, there's a kind of reaction that you might have. 
So you're sitting there, you're a participant in this meeting and whoever the leader is says, I don't want to change. All of you have to change. That creates a response that teaches everybody in that meeting something about how things are going to happen going forward. And Scott, you're smiling. So how would you respond and what would this learning be for you? I've experienced this uh, quite often. Um, I've experienced it in client situations because um, we work with executive teams and sometimes you get the, um, you know, the aggressive type behaviors. But a, a, an idea that comes to mind is you and I were in a training session and um, we did some breakouts and there was just three of us in the room. And I remember, and this is not just picking on you, Donna, but I remember that you walked into that room with the solution in your mind mm -hmm. and you started putting it up on the wall and it just completely shut me down, mm -hmm. which is pretty unusual for me. But <laughs> So from that, you had a learning and it, when you were shut down, then you said, stopped contributing. My opinion didn't matter to you. Mm -hmm. And so, and so I shut down, stopped contributing, and that was, um, you know, I know you well, but if I was in an organization where we were colleagues, um, that would be a beginning of a learning about how to interact. And if I see that happen like more than over once, and over. over and over again, it kind of becomes ingrained in me. Exactly. So that's, that's, per, that's a Exactly right. And what happens, so this isn't necessarily just one experience, although it can be if it's extremely traumatic, like you start a new job and you bring your excited ideas in and somebody shuts you down. Um, and then it happens over and over and over. You eventually learn that's not accepted here. So let's talk about another kind of meeting. So let's imagine we're all in a meeting. The leader of the meeting gets up, shares the objectives of the meeting, and invites everyone to openly share their ideas. What are you thinking about this? Here's, you know, here's the change that's going on. What do you see? The risks. And then somebody in that group puts out an idea that the leader disagrees with. There's two possible responses here, right? Response number one, and I'm actually coaching a CEO, <laughs> who has behaved like this at times, holds up his hand and dismisses it, explaining to the entire group that this will never work. That immediately creates behavior that shuts down that leadership team, right? Another option is to do the yes and, where you acknowledge the idea, build on it, and perhaps even show a different perspective. So again, both responses to the same action by the individual participating, but either response creates a shared experience in that group that everybody learns from what to do and what not to do, what's expected and what never to do. I know for me, now that I'm really attuned to culture, I'll actually walk into a situation and just try to pay attention, you know, what's expected? How do, how do people behave around here? Um, what's okay and what's not okay? All right, so last time that we talked, we talked about defining feedback channels and loops to facilitate shared learning and results. So the examples that we just gave you were sort of in a closed environment, right? This is like a meeting happens and people behave in a certain way. And so consequently, you learn what to do and what not to do in that setting. But beyond that, when you're trying to create culture change, that goes beyond just a meeting. There's other areas that um, that can take place. So the question is, how do you ensure that you're learning what's going on and you're paying attention to various culture friction points that are arising in the organization? And the reason for that is because you want to make sure that the behaviors you're moving to as you identify them in the from to are in fact being reinforced. Because um, there's nothing worse in a culture change initiative than leaders standing up in front of a group and saying, hey, we're going to be one team. It's all of us in this together. And then going off and in their actions demonstrating how actually they're not one team. They're separate and they're going to go have side conversations on their own. So it's really important that you create these feedback channels and some loops through the change project um, so that you learn what's going on.
And the other reality, you probably are all very, very well aware of this, is that leaders tend to be isolated and have a completely different view of the organization. So Scott, how many times as we're debriefing um, leadership teams, would their results look different? Very different from the rest of the organization, sometimes shockingly so. Mm -hmm. So they often are, have the impression that things are going really well. You know, they might have an idea that maybe not perfect, but it's pretty good. Yeah, they're living in a bubble. <laughs> so that's another reason why having these feedback channels and loops is really essential because it helps understand what's going on. So to that end, and I know some of the brilliant participants in our last webinar conversation actually talked about this, where they set up, um, whether you call it a change advisory network or um, have culture or change champions, whatever your particular language is around it, we like to talk about this as you are formalizing the informal grapevine. And the idea is, um, and this is just an example. I'm sure you guys have probably done this a lot of different ways. Um, we've seen it where this is an opportunity for uh, high, high performers or high potentials um, in an organization where they have an opportunity to participate in this group. Um, we've also seen it done where the representatives come from functional areas. So they serve as a link. Um, we set up a strategic change office where they function were the link between that particular operations area and the larger strategic change office. So that was kind of the feedback back and forth. So you need to put some thought into the correct structure, but the idea is, and the why, um, is so that you get the two-way communication. So we... Beth asked the question, if we have a specific best practice for how to bust their bubble and get leaders' attention, there's a couple of different ways. And um, I will point you to Tim Coupler's book, Build the Culture Advantage, because I wrote about a couple of different ideas in that book. But we'll be sending out um, information on these things after the webinar. So if there's questions in here that don't get addressed, we'll see the questions and then send out information. Terrific. So in, um, in the situation that we're describing, we actually set this change advisory network up so that they would have monthly conversations and they had developed the change advisory network made up of members within their particular functional area where it served as a two-way conversation. They, um, the change advisory network member or leader, they would bring information to their group about changes that were going on or even messages that were going to be sent out. And it would enable them to say, you know, how did you understand this? And so if something was inconsistently received or people in the organization like were not getting the message, um, then we were able to understand that and address it rather than it, than it carrying on. Um, I know one of the really big um, discoveries we had in this process, we had done an assessment of all the changes going on in that organization and found out that they were pretty much overwhelmed or saturated with change. So the leadership team, in recognizing that, and kudos to them, took that information and reprioritized. And they said, we're actually going to cancel some projects. I know, hallelujah, because that's not very common, right? A lot of times they just say, do them all. But they said, you know, hey, we recognize that maybe not all of the changes can be accomplished. They eliminated some, and then they defined which were the most important. But what we found through this um, change network was nobody got that message. Remember that? There was people still working on the projects that had been canceled. So somehow that, that information did not make its way through. Somehow um, the leadership team forgot to tell people to stop working on things. But this was a very interesting project and because we did an intense amount of data analysis. We actually wrote a program in Access to take all of the projects that were happening throughout the organization, any kind of change, feeding it into this using an employee database, we were actually able to come up with a heat map of when changes were gonna happen during a particular, during any time of the year. And what we found out is that they were implementing changes that were going to impact their, in this example, their customer service department, which was 800 people, during their busiest time of the year. They were actually scheduling 
more training for these people during their busiest time of the year than they had hours during the week. And the executive running that department thought she knew everything that was going on. But what we showed her was a whole bunch of changes that were being implemented in other departments that were impacting her people during those critical times. This gave the leadership team the ability to make important decisions about whether to delay changes, to stop changes completely, or to bring in additional resources because the change had to get done. But without that information, they're just guessing. So I was really curious, Connie, you were commenting about having a launch and fix culture. <laughs> and hopefully that's different than being agile and just doing things and getting them started. But it was curious because you, you indicated that the president um, was attending a session where improvements were discussed and announced he liked the launch and fix culture. So consequently, based on his words, there was no change in the organization. I'm guessing that meant all of the improvements that were being recommended um, didn't actually take place. So excellent example. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and Connie says, definitely not agile. So uh, good to know. Maybe that's the from is, is that culture and becoming agile would be the to culture. So... <laughs> Excellent. Moving on, um, again, we're still talking about the, in the context of um, shared learning and mutual understanding and the idea of building these uh, learning loops. A lot of times what leaders identify as communication is actually one way. And again, all of you brilliant change practitioners on the phone are very well aware of this. But I think it's sometimes helpful to really lay it out and say, look, you know, you can either push information at people or make it a two-way conversation. And, um, and when you do, you have the benefit of creating that shared learning and mutual understanding because it's through conversation um, that, that people develop their insights and do make meaning out of the things that are going on. Um, in fact, kind of a tangent here, but that's one of the key functions of great leadership is making meaning. You know, too many times I see that leaders just assume people can connect the dots and understand, hey, if we're doing this, it means that. And in reality, um, we're all so inundated with information that's actually not happening. In addition to that, on your tangent, leaders need to have a consistent message and not keep changing the way they describe a story so that people, because we've had a leader that is, had a strategy, wasn't changing it, but every time he'd get up in front of the organization, they would say, why are you changing the strategy again? He just felt it was important to update and refresh his PowerPoints. And so everything always looked different to people. And the strategy was the same. Exactly. So again, just a reminder here, in order to create those, that two-way learning, um, you need two-way channels. All right, so the very last thing we wanted to share with you here was the mistaken identity story. So this was a story of change where um, it was a pretty significant change. So it was a large organization that were moving from having decentralized field offices to bringing in some of the key functions um, to headquarters. And it was fascinating because as the project team learned about this concept of change management and they heard this term called resistance, they immediately identified uh, the fact that the leaders in those field offices were being resistant. And they assumed that that resistance was caused by their um, opposition to the change. So this is, this is a, I guess, a common uh, challenge that we can find ourselves in is misdiagnosing resistance. Instead of being anti-change, as we delved into the true um, facts and spoke with many of the leaders in these field offices, what we discovered was that they had some fundamental beliefs about the value that they provided to their customer. They felt that some of the actions, some of the um, capabilities, the things that they did was part of the reason that their customers worked for them. And that if, in fact, those things were decentralized and taken away from them, they would no longer be providing the value that they felt was so important. On top of that, 
they were very open to the change, but they had the experience, the quality of the centralized process, the centralized functions that were being delivered had significantly decreased. So they had those cultural beliefs where they're the reason customer does business with me is because I do these things and you now want to take that process away from me and you're not going to do it as well as I do it. So this was an example of a situation where the project team immediately labeled them as resistors and they wanted to go to the project sponsor and just say, look, these leaders are being resistant and they're not buying into the change. When in fact, the reality was it was a culture situation. It was a, an underlying cultural belief that we had to address. And so instead of just saying to the, the project sponsor, the change sponsor, hey, you need to talk to these field leaders and make them change. Um, what we realized was we needed to rebuild trust between the project team and between those field leaders about the quality and about the value that was going to be delivered. Because after all, they were all in the same organization. And they all were serving the same customer. So they just needed to work together differently. So that's an example of how culture and underlying beliefs can cause resistance to a change and then get mislabeled. All right, so we highlighted in our time together today um, just kind of the application of some of these 15 key culture items. Uh, we hope that this time was useful to you as we talked through messages that matter we shared with you a little bit about that from to tool where you got into the very specifics of behavior. Um, we talked about how to create shared learning and mutual understanding and then be very careful when it comes to diagnosing resistance that um, is it really because people don't want to change or is it simply because there's some deeper cultural challenges that are occurring uh, that you need to address the culture versus the, the person's desire. So again, why do we do culturally intelligent change? Well, the bottom line here, um, as we're looking at this, culturally intelligent change is no different than doing great change management. Um, we're just acknowledging by calling out the word culture that it's incredibly important. And the bottom line of doing this is that our objective is to decrease resistance and get the results you need to be successful. And so many times, culture is at the heart of that. So one of the things I wanted to point out is some resources. All of you generously shared your best resources. Um, if you have some additional ones, would love for you to continue adding those in the chat box. But we will include these, a, a list of great resources for change as well as culture for those of you who are interested everything from um, blog posts to books to anything that you find helpful. So those are the resources. Next, just quickly wanted to cover um, actions. So we'd love for, for you to email us. Tell us what's going on. What are your questions? What have you observed? What's challenging you? Um, we'd love to hear from all of you amazing and brilliant change practitioners and culture gurus. So feel free to email us at change at brightleadership.com. Next, um, and we're going to follow up again with a message that has links so that you can get the checklist and the ebook, but download that information and um, take a look through it. It gives deeper insight between, be, um, deeper insight into each of those 15 key culture actions. And then, um, last but not least, we are going to be doing another webinar, um, and the title of it is Failure Proof Your Projects. So Scott, wouldn't we have benefited tremendously from this if we had this earlier in our careers? Yes, indeed. It's been uh, awesome learning in recent uh, years with all of the advances in neuroscience and understanding how situations impact the way that you react and the way that you respond. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, this actually, the topic of this webinar comes from um, this past week. I was in Boston working at the, um, not working, presenting at the Million Dollar Consulting Convention. This was my topic and it was incredibly well received. And I thought, 
Wow, what a wonderful way to be able to share some great content with all of the amazing people on this webinar. So the idea is not necessarily like being a better, um, it's not about the technical nature of what you're doing. It's really um, some other aspects of how you can work in the context of your projects to make sure that you're successful. I see that Connie asked a question and um, she was wondering, she said, do we use the OCI, OEI in all of our consulting? Are there other ways to diagnose culture that doesn't involve surveying? And the reason she said that, and I can completely appreciate this, Connie, is that we're a very survey exhausted company, engagement surveys galore. So um, yes, there are other ways. There's qualitative ways of gathering culture information. Um, there's, and there's also ways where you can do subsets. So I know there's one organization I worked with, um, they probably, you have to make sure you get a statistically valid sample, but you can do a smaller number of um, people surveyed so you're not doing the whole organization. Um, so yes, we use it quite frequently, but there are other ways. So um, if we can help you kind of figure out a way to get to the heart and get some insights on your culture that will help make you more successful, we'd love to do that if you want to reach out to us. But I can appreciate the fact for many people, um, it's challenging in organizations where they do a lot of surveys. Um, the other thing that we wanted to offer everyone was the Change Leader Toolkit. Again, we'll provide the link for this, but this was our way of helping change leaders be more successful. So we always hear like, okay, well, here are the things that change leaders are supposed to do, but how many resources actually help coach them through the processes and the actions they need to take to do their role well. So that's why we created the change leader toolkit and we make that available to all of you. And with that, we want to say thank you all of you for spending this time with us. Um, culture change is not easy. So that's why we say welcome to perseverance. Stay strong, hang in there. Um, it takes time, but it's well worth the journey. So here's to all of your brilliance and uh, we look forward to you joining us next month. Thank Thanks. you everyone.